what gets measured gets managed. You should know these numbers by heart if you want to grow and optimize your business. Hi, I'm Rob Walling. I'm a startup founder with multiple exits. I'm the author of three books on the topic of building, launching, and growing startups. And I'm an investor in almost 80 companies. Today, I'm going to be talking about SaaS metrics, giving you the best guide to software as a service KPIs. Let's dive in. In a SaaS app, like any company, we do need to know numbers. Some folks get overwhelmed to the point where they're trying to track 30 different numbers. Too many things can be too distracting. Key performance indicators are the things that we are going to monitor. I have the three high, three low framework of the six SaaS metrics you should be covering. The first one, the cost to acquire a customer. It's often pronounced CAC. This number you want to be low. What are some ways that you can essentially lower it. And I don't just mean little tactics, but like if you're deciding which, which app to build or what industry to build in, that can have a major impact on your cost to acquire a customer. One way to have a low CAC is to enter a large market with a large incumbent where people are looking to switch away from that incumbent. Maybe that incumbent has raised their prices so much over time that people don't feel like they're getting the value and they it just feels outrageously expensive for what they're getting. Maybe that incumbent is not innovating anymore and their product is lagging. Maybe the product is really buggy. Maybe the sales process is annoying and people just have a bad taste in their mouth. You can imagine uh, examples with a big incumbent like Salesforce, right? It's a big company started 20 years ago, I think now. And so the product is obviously kind of, kind of tough to work with. It's very expensive. The sales process is onerous. It's all the things that make people dislike a company and not want to use their software. So you can imagine Pipedrive and Close.com, which are Salesforce competitors, they probably have a pretty easy time picking away their Salesforce refugees who really want to get out and they are looking to switch actively because when people are not looking to switch, it's harder to find them. With Drip, which was an ESP that I built and sold in 2016, we looked at Infusionsoft and Entreport, which were these marketing automation platforms and people did not like them. The software was awful. It was buggy. The sales process was rough. They were expensive. It was all the things that you wanted. And we found it very easy to pull refugees from them. You can imagine uh, Intercom these days. I think the Intercom's product offering is still really good, but word on the street is that their pricing feels a little high. The pricing feels a lot high to a lot of SaaS founders and they're looking to switch away and figure out intercom replacements. And so a company like UserList, who does part of what intercom does is, is reaping the benefit of that, right? So this is one way to have a uh, low cost to acquire a customer. Another way is to really double down on content and organic search. Organic search and ranking in whether it's Google, whether you rank in Amazon, whether you rank in WordPress plugin repo, whether you rank in YouTube, Organic search is a way to get free traffic. And I put free in quotes because really it's free except for your time. You know, I'm assuming your founder, your early stage, you're gonna be doing a lot of this yourself. Organic search is actually quite expensive if you have to hire a team to do it. But there are companies um, in Tiny Seed, the startup accelerator that I run, who have really mastered the art of SEO and are ranking very high for terms that apply to their business. And one example of that is, and they've been very public about this, is Scraping B. They are now a seven-figure business. Again, they're public about this, and they have done a tremendous amount of that through content and SEO. And they have a low cost to acquire a customer because of it. When you get into things like pay-per-click ads, you know, AdWords and such, um, that is where things get expensive. I'm not saying you shouldn't do them, but I am saying your cost to acquire uh, will go up. In a lot of spaces, having a high cost to acquire is a necessity, right? If you're marketing into construction firms or you're marketing into government or education, you know, there's a lot of things where the cost to acquire is going to be really high. Another way to keep your cost to acquire low is to enter a space with lots of online chatter. There's a lot of forums, there's a lot of Facebook groups, et cetera, that are already talking about them. If people are already online, they can tend to be easier to reach if you hang out in those groups and you have conversations. And the fourth way that I was, uh, as I was brainstorming this, to have low cost acquire is if there are people with audiences talking about the problem that your tool solves. So there are a lot of people already with podcast audiences, YouTube audiences, you know, blog followings that are talking about marketing, entrepreneurship, startups. And so if you have a tool for one of those audiences, you can get in front of their audience. That is a way to kickstart or quickly get a lot of customers at low cost. You know that there are many fewer big audiences, podcasts and such, with audiences of like CEOs of large construction firms or heads of government agencies. I'm sure they exist, but you know that it's not going to be as easy to reach those folks. And therefore, 
the cost to acquire is going to be higher. What you'll notice is that a lot of these KPIs are in opposition to each other. They're in tension. So right now I'm going to say cost to acquire customer should be low, or you want it to be as low as possible. Um, and then when we talk about things that we want to be high, I'll talk about, you know, annual contract value needing to be high. And oftentimes the higher that is, the higher it is to acquire a customer because they're worth more. So you will see that these things are intention. But again, in a perfect world, the three high, three low framework has three of these you're trying to push up. You want them as high as possible and three that you're trying to move, you move lower. That's our first one. The second one is sales effort. This is when we want to keep low. So I'm defining sales effort as both like how many calls, how many touch points you have to make in order to make a sale and how long the sales cycle is. So it's duration plus number of touch points. And I'm calling that sales effort. How can we keep this low? What are ways to keep it low? So the first one is to enter a space where you can have self-service sign up and onboarding. I often call this low touch or no touch sales process. And so examples of this are low cost tools like snappa.com, which does social media images. And I've interviewed the founder, Chris Gimmer, and he said, yeah, our churn is higher than we'd like it to be, but it's really easy to get new customers. It's not expensive. They, going back to the low cost to acquire, they're really good at SEO and they have a self-serve sign up and onboarding process. And so Snappa has taken advantage of really low sales cost. Squadcast.fm, which is where I record all three of my podcasts. It's podcast recording software. And while they do have big enterprises coming for, you know, multi-thousand dollar deals, they also have $9 a month, $14 a month plans. And so they've built out self-service signup and onboarding. There's spaces where you just can't do self-serve signup and onboarding. It's just not going to work. But a lot of spaces um, and a lot of industries and a lot of customer types, you can do a one call close and trying to get to the point where the the decision is not made by committee. Maybe it's made by a founder or a developer or a single developer manager. That's when you can do a one call close. If the decision is made by multiple people and they can't all be on one call, then it's always going to be a call and a back and forth and you, you needing to provide more sales material, usually a second call. And that's when sales effort increases. So again, I'm not saying that you can't succeed if you don't have a one call close because there are many companies that I'm intimately familiar with that do, but they spend a lot of their time trying to shrink that sales effort because it's expensive and it's time consuming. All right. The third uh, metric, third KPI in our three low uh, category is churn. Churn is the percentage of people that are canceling each month. Churn is the Achilles heel of SaaS. It is what kills SaaS apps. How do you get your churn low? That's a huge goal. If you can get your churn low, you can grow infinitely. Just incredible. You can get your churn low by having product market fit, which I know is not helpful because that feels like more jargon, but product market fit is that you've built something that people really want and are willing to pay for. And once you hit that point and then you're finding the right people and you're turning away the wrong people, oftentimes with positioning or with raising your prices or with uh, even a qualification process, a demo only, you know, I've seen companies do all kinds of things. You can uh, drive your churn down overall. But there's some other ways to do it too, like having exceptional onboarding that gets people to that aha moment quickly. So if you go to useronboard.com, you can see Samuel Hulick reviewing a bunch of uh, big you know, onboarding flows and you can get some best practices from there. I call it the minimum path to awesome MPA. And it's what's the minimum path to where that customer is basically getting value out of your product. Because if people don't onboard, they're going to churn. Product market fit will give you low churn over the long term. It means people won't leave in six months, 12 months, 18 months. You'll have a very long lifetime value of that customer. If they're not getting onboarded in the first place, product market fit doesn't help you very much. It helps you a little because people will be motivated to try. But if your onboarding isn't good, you're still going to have churn. So having things like easy setup, couple clicks to import from their old tool. They don't need a consultant to get set up. These are ways that you can cut that first 60 or 90 day churn. And then having you know product market fit really gets you that post 60 to 90 days. So there's two different factors in there. Last one I thought of for keeping churn low is having product innovation so that you don't become that stodgy incumbent that I mentioned above. As much as you know, we want to raise prices over time with SaaS, I mean, that's like a, a great secret. You also don't want to become the company or the app who's raising prices and not innovating. And now we're going to look at the three metrics slash KPIs that we want to increase. 
The first is annual contract value. A way to keep your ACV high is to sell to businesses. And usually it's the larger, the better. And so this is one of those that I was talking about is intention with cost to acquire customer. Cause usually selling to larger customers requires more sales effort and, you know, has, uh, requires more, um, a, a higher cost to acquire, but selling to businesses, not consumers. Um, and then, you know, the larger the businesses are usually the, the more they're able to afford, um, to, to pay more. There's a balance here. Cause if you do want to go self-serve and you know, you want that one call close. Well, you can't, you can't sell the massive fortune 5,000, 500 companies, right? Cause they're not gonna, not gonna be doing it. Another way to keep your ACV high is to price based on value metrics. And that of course is the more value the customer gets out of your product, the more they should pay you. And usually with, let's say an ESP, an email service provider, this is based on the number of subscribers they have. Or if you're using CRM software, it's based on the number of seats, number of salespeople, because the more salespeople you have, you're likely getting more value from the software. So pricing based on value, pricing based on value metric is another way, another way to raise ACV. And as every microconf ever has told you, and hopefully I've told you this enough over the years, you should raise your prices over time. That's just the natural progression of SaaS. It's a natural progression of the economy, right? That money becomes less valuable over time. So even, uh, you know, the dollar store is going to raise their prices to a buck 25 for everything because, because you just have to, because even small amounts of inflation will do that. Not only that, but SaaS is evolving and getting better over time. You are providing more value and therefore um, you should raise prices. Expansion revenue. So every business wants subscription revenue because it is the business cheat code. This is my, this is my quote. I've been saying this on all my pricing talks. Every business wants subscription revenue because it's the business cheat code, but we get that for free with SaaS because we have subscription revenue built in. In SaaS, expansion revenue is the cheat code. And the way to get expansion revenue is that as customers get more value out of your product that automatically, poof, they pop up into a higher tier or they pay you a little more, right? So this comes back to the value metric I talked about earlier, but you can do it with a value metric. You can do it with feature gating, or you can use uh, both. You want to charge more to your customers, but you want to charge more to your right customers. And you have different segments of customers that are willing to pay more. And for those folks, um, you got to figure out what is that value metric or the feature gate to get them there. And lastly, the sixth KPI, it's the third in the three high is referrals. You want there to be a lot of referrals because that natural flywheel of virality or of, of constant referrals is a huge, it can have huge conversion rates. And in fact, word of mouth at, over time can become one of your biggest drivers and one of certainly one of your highest converting drivers. So with referrals, like truly having a viral loop is best. So when I send out my savvy cat link to people to book time on my calendar, they look at it and they think, oh, I wonder if I could use Savvy Cal, right? They're on a page that says powered by Savvy Cal. Like that is a true built-in virality. It's pretty cool. Same thing with SignWell. It's an electronic signature app. When you send out the link, people go to sign it and they say, oh, this is a really nice app. Maybe I'll try it, right? So having that built in is pretty incredible. If you can't do that, if there's no way for you to get some type of virality, you can ask for referrals. Usually if you see people converting and being really happy with your product, getting onboarded um, at 60 to 90 day range, then within a few weeks of that, I would have an automated email that goes out and says, hey, we were, you know, so much of our business and it is, is based on referrals. If you're really enjoying it, could you please refer a customer? Could you please pass this along? Could you please make an intro? You know, you, you get your, figure out your ask there. So the six SaaS KPIs you should be tracking, there's the three low, which are cost to acquire customer, sales effort, and churn. And then the three high is annual contract value, expansion revenue, and referrals. Thanks so much for joining me today. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button below and subscribe to the channel. We have so much good content coming out on this channel every week. And we have a couple additional videos that I can recommend. You can click on these. They should be right on the screen here. Uh, so you can dig in further to SaaS metrics and learn more and go deeper on this topic. I'll see you next time.